All right, my name is Olivier, and I'm one of of the person the brother my brother keeper program, and I'm usually my friend. We are like four four of us, and today I'm only gonna be one. Sadly, yes. Can you introduce yourself? Too? Well, you want me to introduce myself? Yeah. Um, hi, I am John Murad. I'm the acting chief of police for Burlington, Vermont. Nice. Right, my first question is uh. Oh, so what do you do like in your position? In my position, I get to lead the men and women of the Burlington Police Department. I get to work with uh, terrific people, officers, sworn officers, dispatchers. We have community service officers who are unsworn, unarmed people. They're not like police officers who have law enforcement powers, but they do a lot of good work with the community. I have community support liaisons. Those are people who work uh, they do social work, they work in mental health, they work with people who don't have homes, they work uh, with people who are suffering from substance use disorder. And uh, I also have records keepers and I have people who do the kind of work that we see on TV shows like CSI, we call them ID technicians. Um, and there are a whole bunch of people in this police department who do a lot of different kinds of work around one shared mission. And that mission is very simply, that we keep people safe by responding to and preventing crime and disorder with and for our neighbors. Oh, yeah, okay. My, uh, since you, like, my other question is, like, since you, a lot of your thing you guys do is about community, like, what is something, like, they're trying to progress, like, for, yeah, for, like, right now? Something you guys are focusing. So, some, so how are we trying to sort of work on the community aspect? Um, mm -hmm. You know, among the things we've done is we've created some of those positions that I just talked about. The, the community support liaison position, for example, is a way for us to connect with parts of the community that we weren't serving as well as we wanted to with police officers. And so we created a role that is unarmed um, and that doesn't have police enforcement powers, but nevertheless works with police uh, to help people who are suffering from mental health issues, or who are experiencing houselessness. Um, and that's a, a way. Another way that we try to connect is we are very transparent with our data and our information. Um, there is a portal on the city website on which we publish all of our data. There are a number of different ways that you can look at how many activities police do, how many incidents we respond to, what kinds of crimes those incidents include. Um, every single use of force that police officers uh, engage in is published on that site because use of force is, is a unfortunate reality of some type of police work, um, but it has to be done in a way that's lawful and is in keeping with training and policy. And so every single time it happens, uh, we put together a narrative of it, a picture of who did it, who's involved in it, who was the subject of it, and we put that up online as a way of being transparent with the community and connecting with the community. Other kinds of things that we did in the past, community barbecues, um, creamy with a cop events, many of those have fallen by the wayside owing in part to the pandemic and in part to the fact that this agency uh, was uh, defunded for a period of time and we, we went from a, a relatively adequate uh, headcount of, of 105 authorized officers. Usually we had about 96. Um, and we now have 69 officers and only 64 of them are actually available to work. So to go from 96 officers to 64 officers has made it much more difficult to do some of the connective things that we used to do with the community. And that is not to anyone's benefit. It's not to our benefit with working with the community um, being uh, servants of the community as best we can. And it's not to the community's benefit either because we are missing some of those connections that allow us to be uh, better uh, better uh, peacekeepers and people who, who keep folks safe. Mm -hmm. well, yeah. uh, how long have you been working uh, in your position? I have been here with the Burlington Police Department since uh, October of 2018, so just over three years. I was born in Burlington and I grew up out in Underhill. I went to Mount Mansfield Union High School. Um, I left to go to college. Uh, I went to Harvard University. I then moved out to California. I then moved to New York for a while and was a cop. And I was a cop in New York City for 12 years. 
I rose from police officer to assistant commissioner. Um, I left the NYPD to go to the private sector for two years. And although I, it was, it was a, a lucrative job, it wasn't a satisfying job, not for me. And so I, I took a 60% pay cut to come back to public service to join the Burlington Police Department when they advertised for a deputy chief job. I got to not only come back to public service, but also come home to the city in which I was born, the, the, the county where my parents still live. I moved here with my wife and my two kids who are now in the public schools here in Burlington. We live in Burlington. I am incredibly privileged to get to serve this city every day and to get to work with the men and women who are inside this police department and to then be a part of this community. Oh, my other question is, uh, I mean, since you've been working for, like, I think, three years now, I mean, it's not that, yeah, it's not that long. So we're like uh, one of the hardest, yeah, like in, in your position, like the hardest thing so far. So uh, <clears throat> the hardest thing so far has absolutely been dealing with a, uh, a very passionate cry for changes in policing that was implemented in a way that meant our police department got a lot smaller than than it should be. And so we, the murder of George Floyd, mm -hmm. an utterly horrible, horrible event. Um, one that, that, that was the catalyst for a national reckoning with issues that have bedeviled our country since before it was founded, that have been with us since, uh, since really Europeans first arrived on this continent, 400 years. Um, and, and that murder uh, caused a, a huge movement around the country uh, that in Burlington saw a, a really unusually um, extreme reaction. And that extreme reaction was a decision by our city council, driven by hundreds of callers, to say, we want to defund the Burlington Police Department. We want it to be 30% smaller. Um, that wasn't done with a lot of deliberation. It wasn't done with, a, with any kind of study or any kind of sense of, is this going to work or what do we put in place instead? And, and yet it was put in place and we then had to watch as the officer, as the, excuse me, as the department got smaller and we were still getting calls from the public and we weren't able to answer them as well. And I have worked with many others to, to build these new positions we talked about, the community service officers, the community support liaisons, to implement what we call a priority response model. All of these efforts to deal with the repercussions of that decision uh, that was driven by such an important national moment. And so, so that's by far been the largest challenge of, of my career um, here in Burlington. In, in New York, I was an assistant commissioner at the same time uh, as two officers were assassinated today, actually. Seven years ago today, two police officers named Rafael Ramos and Wen Jin Lu were assassinated by a man who, who claimed to be doing it on behalf of protesters around the uh, killings of, of Eric Garner and of Michael Brown and Ferguson. And there was then, seven years ago, a, a really big movement around police reform. This man, he was not well. He was a criminal. He, he said he was acting on behalf of that movement. He was not. He murdered these two police officers. And, and that created a huge crisis in New York City that I dealt with. Uh, here in Burlington, dealing with this crisis, thank God it does not involve any death, it doesn't involve anybody hurt here in our city in that same way, but it is, it's been as stressful. And certainly I was an assistant commissioner there, which is a, a, a very high rank, but not the top. When you're at the top of an entity, it's, it's very stressful. Uh, you are the person with whom the buck stops is the old expression. The buck stops with me. You're a person who has to make certain decisions. You have a responsibility to the people with whom you work and who you lead. And uh, you know, I have a responsibility to my boss too, the mayor, and, and above him, my, my real boss, the community, to try to get it right. And it has been a very challenging time to get things right. So that's been the, the sort of biggest thing that I've dealt with here in the course of three years. Yeah, okay, another question is like, to be honest, being a police is like a hard, hard job. It's because you guys actually support us a lot. And as well, do you feel like uh, the community also supports you guys more too? So I, I, I do, so first of all, I think the community supports us, period. I know that there was a time where certainly there was a lot, there were many voices saying, we're concerned about policing. Maybe we don't want policing to be the same as it is now. We don't like the way policing has been done in the past. 
both here and across the country. But overall, we have a very supportive community. And, and I think that a reason for that is that this agency, while not perfect, it is not a perfect agency, has done a lot of things very, very well and often before other places have. This was the first police department in the state to adopt body cameras. It was among the first to uh, embrace community policing, to work with street outreach so that it was talking about mental health in ways that weren't just about enforcement. Um, it created uh, a system called uh, ICAT, dissolve, uh, which is designed to, to talk to people in mental health crisis without using force. Uh, we worked together with Mayor Weinberger on a program called Comstat, which was directed at the opioid epidemic and had real success until the pandemic intervened and, and took away the focus on opioids. And we've seen opioids skyrocket since. Um, there's a lot of things that this department has done well. There are things that it needs to work on. We continue to have racial disparity in our enforcement numbers and in our use of force numbers. The question is where those disparities come from. Are those disparities that are caused by the officers? Are they caused by upstream sociological issues about who commits certain kinds of crime or disorder? These are really complicated issues, but this department hasn't shied away from tackling them. And I think that that creates a system in which we have a community that's largely supportive of us. I think over the past year, that support hasn't always been as clear to the men and women inside the police department. They have not felt that support as strongly as they used to. And that is why some of them left. We lost uh, more than, than 20 officers over the past 18 months. Um, and they weren't fired. They left because they did not feel that sense of support. They didn't feel valued by the community. But I think that's it's wrong. And I try to tell the officers with whom I work every day that they are valued by the community. They're certainly valued by me. I know they're valued by the mayor. I know they're valued by the people that we serve uh, and our neighbors for whom we work. Um, but, uh, you know, it is a tough job. It's a tough job that has a, uh, an opportunity every day to make somebody's life better. But conversely, your actions can make people's lives, you know, worse too. You can, you can get things wrong. And so those stakes are, are very, very important. We, we ask a lot of our police officers. I chose to become a police officer in part uh, for a number of reasons, but one part was that my brother is, is a surgeon. And I, at the time, was in Hollywood. I was trying to be famous. I was much younger. And uh, I looked at what my brother was doing, and he was contributing. He had a job that mattered. He had a job that the stakes mattered. If he messes up on his job, there are consequences. I didn't feel that way with what I was doing in California. And then 9-11 happened. And 9-11 also made me say, you know what? I was given a lot. I was given a lot by my parents. I was given a lot by my community. I have certain skills and abilities that uh, are, are a blessing. And I owe it to my fellows to give that back as best I can. That when we serve one another, we are, are, are fulfilling a tab that came from, from somewhere else. Uh, and I think we all owe each other something. We are all our, our each other's keeper, right? We are all our brother's keepers. We are all our sister's keepers. And that, that's the lesson of that little piece of scripture. It is the notion that, that, you know, that yes, we owe it to one another to take care of one another as best we can. And so for me, uh, finding an opportunity to do that involved going to New York um, and ultimately becoming a police officer there because I felt that that was the best way that I could give back to the community I lived in. Yeah, yeah, that's very really nice. Uh, I have another question. <clears throat> we also heard that like uh, you don't really have to be become a police like to go. You don't have to go to college to become a police officer. Like after high school, you can go to training and become one of them. So in my opinion, I was wondering that, don't you think, like, <coughs> excuse me, since like being a police is a hard job, don't you think like maybe they should get more education? Like, <coughs> So great question, great yeah. question. Um, and uh, the, the Burlington Police Department does not require a college degree, but we do require um, that people have uh, a certain amount of <coughs> we want them to have some college, an associate's degree or equivalent, or we want them to have military experience or other life experience that's commensurate and somehow gives them uh, a little bit of that. But even though we don't require it, 
the majority of our employees do have college degrees. About, about 66% of our department right now has, I, I, if I were with you, I'd get you the water myself. Um, I, I don't want you to call. Yeah. Um, right now, about 60% or 66% of our department has a college degree or more. We have a number of officers who have uh, master's degrees and, and other graduate degrees. Yeah. But most of our department has a college degree. That's not true of the profession. Around the country, many other departments don't have that. The New York City Police Department, which is by far the largest police department in the country, uh, has, has uh, New York City Police Department has 36,000 police officers. Burlington has 44,000 residents, right? So the New York City Police Department could, could basically take over Burlington tomorrow uh, and, and just occupy the whole space and fill it all up. But... Um, of those 36,000 police officers, only 33% have a college degree or higher. Uh, everyone else, you have to have either a military or an associate's degree there, but you don't have to have a full bachelor's degree. I think that getting an education brings a lot to the job. I think that people who've gotten an education definitely bring things to the job. I also don't want to foreclose on the idea that people who don't have a college education may have something to contribute. And if you make a, a hard rule that says, you know, never, I think you might limit yourself. Um, and, and that's especially true if you are trying to recruit from groups of people who haven't had the same access to college as others have, right? If, if you're excluding them, then you might be cutting off your nose to spite your face or in, in, in thinking that you're, you're cutting off your nose, thinking that you're doing your face a favor and you're not. Uh, so while I definitely prioritize college, and I'm glad that this agency has a higher than, than the national rate uh, of college graduates, I wouldn't say I want to prohibit it entirely. Taking somebody straight from high school? Absolutely not. I would never do that in this agency. Uh, you, you've got, A, you have to be 21 to be a police officer because you have to be able to enforce the law and do certain kinds of things. But, but B, I just don't think the life experience is there. And we're asking a lot of the people who do it. I do, however, have some great roles. Uh, we have roles in the summertime called Beach and Parkers. Uh, we have used high school graduates for those. And we also have these community service officer positions that I talked about, and those do not require a bachelor's degree. Um, uh, we still probably wouldn't take somebody who's, who's 18, but I'm not 100% sure. Actually, I'm not certain that's true. I think that if, if a, a candidate presented himself or herself and was 18 and was really uh, uniquely qualified, I think we would take that individual. I don't think we are, I don't think we have an age limit, but, um, but those don't, you know, uh, those are other opportunities to get into this profession in this department and be able to, to experience what it's like and get to work with uh, police officers and in the policing field and see how that fits in, in your expectations. Uh, oh, well, that's all a question. I have a different question for me too. <laughs> uh, do, well, okay. So, uh, I do have I have some great questions uh, with with regard to this this project. You know, what is it that you're seeking? Are, are you looking for like a unified sort of theory around how we take care of one another, or are you just you know investigating really interesting jobs and ideas and learning what you can about those in order to become a more well-rounded person yourself? Uh, honestly, just to like uh, I feel like the, maybe the first what you said first time. Just, yeah, to yeah. learn new stuff and, like, uh, yeah, and get them and share with the others, too. I mean, yeah. like, uh, I, like, me, I didn't really know anything. About, like, I've been learning a lot of new stuff that I didn't know a lot just through, like, uh, into asking people questions. Yeah, that's all we do, yeah. That's so, that's really, that's great. So yeah. what it, now, now, what do you do? What do you, other, than, other than this program and getting to interview people and learn stuff, that, that a lot of people your age don't get to do. Uh, what's your uh, What's your cup of tea? Are you a, Are you an athlete? Yeah, I play, play soccer. I play soccer. Yeah, I play yeah. soccer. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much. It was good talking to you. Hopefully, we can do the the uh, thing that we talked about earlier. The ride along. Yeah. 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 And if we can't if we can't make that ride along happen, we can absolutely make a visit here and and talking with officers and getting to see the space and and maybe even kind of going out and seeing some of what the officers do, we can make that possible. Yeah, but a, a straight up ride along where you actually go on calls for service, that that may give my city attorney a little bit of uh, of, of, of agita, as they say. So I'll have to see. All right, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you.